Let me take you through this grade nine math final exam I've given to classes in the past. It's out of 107 marks. It starts off with a multiple choice section, and then there are short answer sections on algebra, linear relations, and geometry. I'll show you the full solutions to all the questions, and I'll give you some tips on how to successfully write math exams. Question number one, 87 to the power of zero equals, I know anything to the power of zero, except for zero to the power of zero is equal to one. So C. And for a question like that, where it's a simple evaluating question, type it on your calculator, double check your answer. Question two, a to the power of 10 times a to the power of five written as a single power. Okay, well, I know when multiplying powers with the same base, you keep the base and add the exponents. So we get a to the power of 10 plus five, which is a to the 15. And I see that as an option, C again. Question number three, I have a power of a power where the base of a power is a product of two things. I know the exponent rule tells me I put the outside exponent on both factors of the base. So I have to square the three and I have to square the x to the four. Three squared is nine. X to the four squared, an exponent on top of an exponent, you keep the base and multiply the exponents. Four times two is eight. So I'll find the answer nine x to the eight. Here it is here, C. Now for questions like two and three that involve variables, you can still check your answer. Anytime you're saying that two expressions are equal to each other, like we're saying that a to the 15 is equal to a to the 10 times a to the five. If we're saying two things are equal, pick a test value for a, sub it in, and make sure those two expressions are actually equal to each other. So let's check for, let's pick a value for a, how about three? So I'm verifying question number two right now. So I wanna see is three to the 10, times three to the five, is that equal to three to the 15? If we've chosen the correct answer, it should be equal. Let me check in my calculator. There we go, I verified it's true for three, so we probably have the correct answer. You can follow the same logic for verifying your answer to number three, pick a value for X, plug it into both expressions, make sure they're the same. On to number four, seven to the power of five times seven to the power of, well, if I don't see an exponent, I know it's one divided by seven to the power of three written as a single power. Well, let me combine the first two powers. And when multiplying powers with the same base, you keep the base and add the exponents. Five plus one is six. That product now needs to be divided by seven to the power of three. Those powers again have the same base, so keep the base. And when dividing powers to the same base, you subtract the exponents. Six minus three is three. So seven cubed. And this one will be easily verifiable by typing both expressions on your calculator and making sure they're equivalent. <clears throat> Number five, I have a quotient of two expressions. I wanna simplify it. So I'll start with the coefficients, 18 divided by six, that's three. And now I'm going to look for powers that have the same base that are being divided. So I have two powers of M being divided. So I keep the base and subtract the exponents. Six minus two is four. And I have two powers of n being divided, subtract their exponents, one minus one is zero. It means we have zero n's. So we could just erase that power of n. Or if you wanna use your zero exponent rule, remember n to the power of zero is one. So three m to the four times one is just three m to the four. And here we have it, three m to the four, d. Six. I have a power where the base is a fraction, the exponent applies to the numerator, and the denominator. So I have to square the one and the four. That gives me one over 16. Here's my answer here, A. There we go, we're done the first page of the exam and almost all of these are easily verifiable with your calculator. Number seven. This one we wouldn't be able to verify with the calculator. We just have to know what like terms are. Question seven says, which pair of terms are not like terms? So like terms have the exact same variables with the exact same exponents. As I go through these, part A, both terms have a to the one. B, both terms have an m and an n variable, but the exponents on the n's are different. The first one is an n to the one, the second one is an n to the two, so these ones are not like terms. I would just quickly double check C and D. Notice C, p squared q1, p squared q1, and D, x to the one, x to the one. So we have our correct answer, B. B are not like terms. Notice I didn't care what the coefficients were for any of these, we're just looking at the variable part of each term. Number eight, this expression is a, oh, it wants us to classify by name. 
So we need to know how many terms are there. And the terms are separated by the addition and subtraction signs. So these are the separators, and I see one, two, three terms. That means it's a trinomial. Nine, that same polynomial expression wants to know what's the degree of that polynomial expression. Well, to find the degree of a polynomial, you need to know that it's equal to the degree of the highest degree term. So we need to find the degree of all three terms. The first term, to find its degree, we add the exponents on the variables. Four plus one is five. The second term, one plus three is four. And the last term, six. What's the highest degree term? It's this one, its degree is six. So the degree of the polynomial, six. And of course, your teacher is going to put common mistakes as possible answers, where you have to remember that you don't add the degrees of all the terms, right? It's not 15. It's equal to the degree of the highest degree term, six. Five to the power of negative two is equal to, well, I know the negative exponent rule tells me it's equal to the reciprocal of this, one over the power with a positive exponent. So it's equal to one over five squared, which is one over 25. And once again, this one, when you're saying two things are equal, easily verifiable with your calculator. What value of m makes this equation true? If you know your exponent rules, we should be able to figure this out pretty easily. Because notice on the left side of the equation, I have 6 divided by 2, which is 3. And I have a power of a divided by a power of a. I know I keep the base of the power and subtract the exponents. I need to figure out how can that be equal to 3a to the 5. So to make this equation true, we just have to figure out what can I plug in for m so the exponent becomes 5. Well, what minus 3 equals 5? 8. So my answer, 8. 12, what's the correct solution to x minus 2 equals negative 4? So we just have to use inverse operations to isolate the x. So I'll add the 2 to the other side. And I get negative 2. And any solving an equation question, plug in your answer. Make sure it makes the equation true. Is negative 2 minus 2 equal to negative 4? Yeah, that's the correct answer. And if you had no idea how to do this question, you could literally one by one plug the possible answers into the equation and see which one makes it true. If you thought for some reason 6 was the correct answer, if you plug in 6, 6 minus 2 is 4, not negative 4, so we know that's not the correct answer. 13. Rearrange this formula to isolate h. So I've got a equals b times h over 2. I want to isolate h. I'll start by multiplying both sides of this equation by 2 to get rid of the fraction. So I've got 2a equals, these twos cancel, bh, and then I want to isolate h. So I'll divide both sides by b, because right now that h is being multiplied by b. Inverse of multiplying by b is dividing by b. The b's cancel, and we have 2a over b equals h. So I know h is equal to 2a over b, which is right there, d. 14, solve the equation for x. When you have fraction equals fraction, you can cross multiply. Cross multiplying tells you to write the product of those two terms on one side of the equal sign and the product of these two terms on the other side of the equal. So I'll write four times four x minus one on the left and six times three x plus two on the right. And then I'll solve this equation for x. I'd have to do my multiplying. So I'll distribute the four into the binomial and distribute the six into this binomial, do all my multiplications and solve from there. So I'd have 16 x minus four equals 18 x plus 12 get the terms with an x on one side and the constant terms on the other. I'll bring the constant terms to the left and the variable terms to the right and collect my like terms, negative 16 equals 2x, divide both sides by two, negative 16 divided by two is negative eight. So my correct answer, negative eight. And once again, when solving an equation, take the time, plug it back in for the variable, make sure it makes left side equal to right side. 15 says expand and simplify. So expand means do the multiplications and get rid of the brackets. So I'll distribute the x into this binomial and the negative four into this one. Make sure you distribute negative four, not positive four. That way it gets rid of the brackets all in one step. So my first product, x times x is x squared. x times negative two is negative two x. Negative four times x is negative four x and negative four times one is negative four. Collect the like terms. My only like terms are the two terms in the middle negative 2x minus 4x is negative 6x. So d is my answer. 
y equals 66x represents a direct variation, a partial variation, both direct and partial, or neither. So this is a linear relationship because the exponent on the x is 1. And since y and x vary directly with each other, there's no constant added, we call that a direct variation. 17, on the other hand, there is a constant added after the x term. Therefore, it's a partial variation. Primary source of data means data you are collecting yourself. So let's see which of these is someone collecting data themselves. A, looking up leading scores on NHL.com. Well, NHL.com has a staff that collected those stats, so you're not collecting those stats yourself. Getting information about your stocks from the newspaper. Once again, the newspaper retrieved that data, not you. So that's not primary. C, you're conducting a survey of students in your class to determine the most popular type of music. That's definitely primary because you're asking the questions, you're collecting the data. In part D, same as A and B, someone else has collected the data. You're just referencing the data they've collected. So A, B, and D are secondary. C is primary. 19. Estimating the values beyond the known data for a relation. That's called extrapolation. When you're estimating a value within the set of data that you have, that's called interpolation. And we use the line of best fit to make those extrapolations or interpolations, but this definition is about extrapolation. Okay, we have a distance time graph here. In which section is Rena moving the fastest? Well, speed is a rate of change, and rate of change is represented by the slope of the line. So we're looking what section of this line is the steepest. Now, by just looking at this, I need to decide between P and R. I think those segments are the steepest. So let's figure out which one is steeper. Section P, what's the slope? It would be rise, 1.5 run to slope of P equals rise over run. So 1.5 over 2, which is 0.75. And we're in kilometers per minute. And now let me calculate the slope of R. Now it's going to be a negative slope because the line's going down to the right, but the absolute value tells me the speed. Now the slope of r is down 2 over 2. And it's a little bit confusing in these calculations because the y scale is by 0.5, so the x scale is by 1s. But we can you can figure it out. So rise negative 2, run 2, that's a slope of negative 1 kilometers per minute, right? The negative meaning towards home in this case, right? The distance from home is decreasing. You can also think of that as something called displacement. And the 1 is telling us the speed. 1's bigger than 0.75 which means that R is a steeper slope, which means section R is when she's moving the fastest. 21, the following graph show a person's distance from home. We could think of that once again as displacement. Which graph shows an acceleration away from home? Okay, and it's away from home. So that tells me that it's going to be going up to the right. She's going to be starting close to home and finishing further away from home. So that narrows it down to either this graph or this graph. Now I need to look at which one is showing an acceleration away from home, which means the slope is getting steeper as we move to the right. This one, as we move to the right, the slope starts off pretty shallow, but it keeps getting steeper and steeper and steeper. So moving away at an accelerating rate. So part C. A would be moving towards home at a decelerating rate, B moving away at a constant rate, and D, since the distance isn't changing, she's not moving in that scenario. Oh, and part D asks us that. Graph D, the person's not moving. No movement. 23. Super Hot Fire's earnings vary directly with the number of rap battles he wins. If he earns $250 for winning five battles, what is the constant of variation? This question tells us it's a direct variation, so y equals mx, where y dependent variable would be his earnings, x, independent variable, numbers of rap battles he wins, and m is the constant of variation or the slope or the rate of change, whatever you want to call it. Now, it tells us his earnings for a specific number of rap battle wins. So if we want to calculate m, we can plug in what we have, 250 equals m times 5, then isolate m by dividing both sides by 5, 250 divided by 5 is 50. So I know if he made $250 for winning five battles, that must mean he earns $50 per win. So our answer, B. 24, calculate the slope of this line. Well, I know slope from a line 
is rise over run. Or if you want to do coordinate systems, you can do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. But when we have the graph here, rise over run is probably easy enough. Let's calculate the slope from e to f. To get from e to f, I would have to go down four units. That means the rise is negative four. And then to the right, five units. That means the run is positive five. Now, it wouldn't matter if instead we had have done from f to e. If we had have done from f to e, what would have happened? We would have had to go up four units, which would mean the rise is positive four, but then left five units, which means the run is negative five. Negative four divided by five and four divided by negative five are both negative 0.8. It's the same answer. Doesn't matter whether your negative is in the numerator or denominator, same answer. I can find the equivalent value here, negative four over five. My answer to this question, B. Okay, this equation is given to us in the form y equals mx plus b. It just wants to be able to make sure that you can pull out which of those numbers is the slope, which one's the y-intercept. Slope is m, y-intercept is b. So our slope is negative 3, our y-intercept is 4. D. 26, what is the slope of the line that passes through these two points? Okay, well remember slope is change in y over change in x which we can calculate by doing the second y minus the first y divided by the second x minus the first x. Pick one of these to be your first point. Logically, I'll pick A. This is my first point. Every point has an x and a y. I'll label that x1 and y1 because that's the first point. This is my second point, so x2, y2. Plug into our formula. 8 minus negative 6. Be careful when subtracting a negative. Divided by 7 minus 2. I get 14 over 5. And I see that right here, A. Which lines are parallel? Well, parallel lines have the exact same slope. I don't care about the y-intercepts. We can forget about the y-intercepts. Let's just look for a pair of lines that have the same slope. Slope of 2, slope of 3, those are not parallel. Slope of 5, slope of 5. Okay, those are parallel. B. Let me just check the other ones. Not parallel. Not parallel. B. What is the slope of a line perpendicular to y equals 2 thirds x plus 5? Well, here's the slope of that line, 2 thirds. A perpendicular slope is the negative reciprocal of that, which means I need to flip it and change its sign. I need to make it negative. And we can verify if two slopes are perpendicular by checking if the product of the two slopes is negative 1. Let's check. Is 2 thirds times negative 3 over 2, is that equal to negative 1? If it is, then the slopes are perpendicular. If I multiply these fractions, I get negative 6 over 6. Does that equal negative 1? Of course it does. We verified that they're perpendicular. So negative 3 over 2 is the correct answer, B. 29, what is the slope of a vertical line? Vertical lines have an undefined slope, C. If it was horizontal, it would have a slope of 0. What is the equation of the following line? Okay, well, here's the horizontal line. The equation of any horizontal line is y equals whatever the y-intercept is, because that's the y-coordinate of every single point on this line. What are the y-coordinates of all these points? The y-coordinates of all those points are 5. That's why we define the equation of the line as y equals 5. Why well, it's always 5 on that line. There's my answer. A. 31 says use first differences to determine which table values represents a linear relationship. If it's a linear relationship, that would mean change in y over change in x for each pair of points is the same. It's a constant of variation. So all we have to do to verify that is first, let's verify that the x values are going up by a constant amount for each table. In each table, the x values are going up by one each time. That's true for all tables. So all we need to verify now is which of these tables have the y values also going up by a constant amount. The first table goes up by 2, by 2 again, but then up by 4. So the y values are not changing at a constant rate. So that one does not represent a linear relationship. These ones, the y values go up by 1, then 3, then 5. Okay, also not a linear relationship. This one by 4, 7, 4, nope. This one, finally, 3, 3, 3. The slope of this one is 3. If we did change in y over change in x between any pair of points, we would get a slope of 3. So this one's a linear relationship. It's D. 32. Calculate the perimeter and area of the following. 
Okay, let me start by calculating the perimeter. So perimeter is adding up the side lengths of all the sides on the outside of this object. If this is 12, this is 12. If this is seven, this is seven. I need the inside one here. Well, I know if this is 18, this one would be 18 minus two minus three. So 18 minus five is 13. To find the perimeter, I would add up all the sides. I'll start with this one and then move clockwise around. So it would be two plus seven plus 13 plus seven plus three plus 12 plus 18 plus 12. I would have a perimeter of 74. Okay, well, <laughs> part C is the only one that has that perimeter. That's going to be my answer. Let me verify the area as well, just in case I made a mistake with the perimeter that would let me know that I have a mistake somewhere. Okay, if I want the area of this object, uh, it looks like it's almost a complete rectangle. It just has this part cut out of it. So if I want the area, I can do the area of this whole rectangle minus the area of the blue rectangle. So the area of the full rectangle will be 12 times 18 minus the area of that blue rectangle, which I shaded is seven times 13, right? Area of a rectangle is length times width. So I have 216 minus seven times 13, 70, 21, 91. That gives me an area of 125, which yes, is what we have here. So I've just verified, okay, 32. I'm very confident that's the correct answer. Based on the diagram below, which of the following statements is correct? Angle ABC is 40. Well, angle ABC, if I went from A to B to C, it would be this angle in here. Uh, that angle is not 40. I know that angle is supplementary with the 110 degree angle, right? Angles on a straight line add to 180. So I know this is 70 degrees right here. AB is equal to BC. This side and this side are equal. Um, nope, I don't think those sides are equal because what I have here, let me just fill in this angle right here. This angle is 40. I know that for a couple different reasons. Exterior angle theorem tells me that that angle and that angle have to add to 110. But also I know three angles in a triangle have to add to 180. So I can tell from this triangle that it's isosceles. So AC and BC are equal. AB and BC are not equal. So, so far those two are not true. Oh triangle ABC is isosceles. Yes, it has two equivalent angles. So this is an isosceles triangle. So the answer to this, C. Based on the intersecting lines, which of the following statements is not true? Angle A equals angle C. Yeah, those are opposite angles. So those are equal. So that is true. Angle D equals angle B. Yep, those are opposite angles. That's also true. Angle A plus angle B equals 90. Well, A and B are supplementary. They form a straight line. So I know they add to 180. So this one is not true. Let me just check with part D. Angle D and angle A add to 180. Yes, those form a straight line. They're supplementary. They do add to 180. So C is the only one that's not correct. That's my answer. 35. So I've got two parallel lines cut by a transversal. Which of the following statements is not true? Angle D and F equal 180. Yeah, D and F are co-interior angles. They form the C pattern, which tells me that yes, they do add to 180 degrees. So this one's true. B and H are equal. B and H. Uh, B and H are not equal because I know D and H are equal and D and B are not equal. So B and H, I don't think those are equal to each other. Let me just verify that the other ones are true. C and F are equal. Yep, they form a Z pattern. So C and F alternating angles are equal. And G and E equal 180. G and E, yes, they form a straight line. So they're supplementary. So yes, they do add to 180. So B is the only one that is not true. 36, our last multiple choice question. G and H are complementary. Okay, so complementary means they add to 90 degrees. They form a right angle. It gives me an expression for each of the angles. And it says, what is the measure of each angle? Well, I know they add to 90, so I could set 3x plus 6 plus 2x minus 11. I could set those equal to 90. I could solve for x, plug both my answers into each angle, and get the measure of each angle. So let me collect my like terms. 3x plus 2x is 5x. 6 minus 11 is negative 5, equal to 90. Isolate the variable term by adding 5 to the other side. Divide the 5 to the other side, and I get x is 19. If x is 19, I can now sub for angle G and H. 
angle G is 3 times X, which is 19, plus 6. And angle H is 2 times X, which is 19, minus 11. If I do this, I would get 63 degrees. And if I do this, I would get 27 degrees. Let's see, is there a 63 and 27? Yes, angle G and H, 63 and 27, A. Okay, that's the multiple choice done. We are now on to the short answer section of the exam. Section two is questions about algebra. Number 37 says simplify the following expressions using exponent laws and evaluate where possible. If we look at part A, I have a product of two terms. We need to look at the factors of each of the two terms and see if there are any pairs that when I multiply them together, it will simplify. I'll start by looking at the constant factors of each of the terms. They're the coefficients of the two of them, two and five. They're being multiplied and two times five is 10. Then I'll look at the variable factors of the terms and find the ones that have the same base. I have an a to the six being multiplied by an a cubed. The product rule for powers tells me that when I'm multiplying powers with the same base, I keep the base, so in this case a, and add the exponents. Six plus three is nine. And then I also notice that both of the terms have a factor of b. They're being multiplied together, so I'll keep the base b and add their exponents. One plus three is four. Now that'll be my final answer for this. I can't evaluate it because I don't know the values of a and b, they're variables. But for part b, I should be able to evaluate this one. Let me simplify it first using exponent laws though, because so if I look at the first term, I have a three squared to the power of five. The power of a power rule tells me to keep the base of the power three and multiply the exponents. Two times five is 10. That's being divided by a three to the power of seven. And when dividing powers with the same base, you keep the base the same and subtract the exponents. 10 minus seven is three. And now I need to evaluate this. Now that I've fully simplified it using exponent rules, if I evaluate this three cubed, that means three times three times three, which is 27. Now for this question, if you're writing this exam, you could definitely check and make sure this is right. You could just type the original expression on your calculator and it'll tell you that it's equal to 27. Part C, I have five X to the eight, Y to the eight divided by 15 X cubed Y to the five. This is similar to part A, but instead of the terms being multiplied, they're being divided. So what I'm going to do is look for factors in the numerator and denominator that simplify when dividing them. I'll start by looking at the constant factors, five divided by 15. Think of it as a normal fraction, five over 15. See if you can reduce it. Five goes into five one time and into 15 three times, so I can reduce five over 15 to one over three. Now look for factors that have the same variables. So I have factors of X and factors of Y being divided. If I do the quotient rule of exponents, it tells me that when dividing powers with the same base, you keep the base and subtract the exponents. So when I divide the factors of X, I'm going to keep the base of X and subtract the exponents. Eight minus three is five. And when I divide the powers of Y, I'll keep the base of Y and subtract the exponents. Eight minus five is three. Notice when you're doing these divisions, always put the quotient into the numerator of your fraction. And then if the exponent on any of your factors were negative, you would then take that factor and move it to the denominator to make the exponent positive. We'll see an example of that in the next question. But part C, there's nothing else we can do to that. I mean, we wouldn't write a factor of one, so I'll just rewrite this as x to the five y cubed over three. Part D, part D, once again, I have two terms being divided. I'll start by dividing the constant factors. Four divided by two is two. And you could think of that as two over one if you want. And then I have two factors of x being divided. So when I divide them, I would keep the base of X and subtract the exponents. Two minus four is negative two. You should never leave an answer with a negative exponent in it. So you take the factor that has the negative exponent, so the X to the negative two, and I'll move that to the denominator, which will change the sign of the exponent. So this would become two over one X squared, which I'll just write as X squared. So that would be the final answer to part D. Part E, whenever you have a question that is a quotient, you want to make sure you can simplify the numerator and denominator as much as possible before you try and do any dividing. 
So let me simplify the numerator. In the numerator, I have a power where the base is a product of two factors, a two and an x cubed. So I have to put the exponent of three onto both factors of the base. I have to cube the two and I have to cube the x cubed. In the denominator, I've got two terms being multiplied. I'll multiply the constant factors, four times two is eight. And I'll multiply the variable factors, the x squared and the x to the four, because they have the same base, I can keep the base and add the exponents, two plus four is six. In the numerator, I have a two cubed, which is eight, and an x to the three to the three. The power of a power rule tells me to keep the base and multiply the exponents, that's eight x to the nine. So I have eight x to the nine over eight x to the six. Now that the numerator and denominator are fully simplified, I can do my divisions. If I divide the constant factors, eight divided by eight is one, and x to the nine divided by x to the six, I would keep the base of x and subtract the exponents, nine minus six is three. So I have one x to the three, which we would just write as x to the power of three. Those are all the exponent rule questions. Let's now move on to question 38, which asks us to expand and simplify the following. So part A wants me to do this monomial three multiplied by the binomial of x plus two. To do that multiplication correctly, I have to multiply the x and the two by the three that's out front. So I'll find the product of three times x, which is three x, plus the product of three times two, which is six. Part B, I have two binomials being added together. Anytime you're adding polynomials, you can just drop the brackets and collect the like terms. Like terms are terms that have the same variables with the same exponents. So I have a two X to the one plus another two X to the one. I'll just write those beside each other so you can see they're like terms. And I have two constants a five and a negative seven. I'll be able to collect those together as well. Those are also like terms. 2x plus 2x, when collecting like terms, you just add the coefficients, so 2 plus 2 is 4, and you keep the variable part of the term the same. So 2x plus 2x is 4x. And positive 5 minus 7 is negative 2. Part C, I have a 4x times the binomial 3x minus 5 minus 7 times the binomial x squared plus 2x. To expand and simplify this, I need to do the multiplications and then collect all the like terms. So I'll distribute the 4x, the 3x, and the negative 5, and I'll distribute the negative 7 to the x squared and the 2x. When I do those multiplications, the brackets will be gone, and then I can start collecting my like terms together. So let me find my first product, 4x times 3x. The constant factors get multiplied. 4 times 3 is 12. And the factors of x get multiplied, x times x. That's an x to the one times an x to the one. So I keep the base of x and add the exponents. One plus one is two. Now I'll do four x times negative five. Four x times negative five will give me negative 20 x. Now let's distribute the negative seven to the x squared and the two x. Negative seven times x squared is just negative seven x squared. And negative seven times two x would be negative 14 x. I'll look for like terms. I have a 12x squared and a negative 7x squared. Those are like terms because they have the same variable factors with the same exponents. They both have an x squared. I have a negative 20x and a negative 14x. Those both have an x to the 1. So those are also like terms. When I collect these together, 12x squared minus 7x squared, I just subtract the coefficients. 12 minus 7 is 5. And I keep the variable part the same, x squared. And I have negative 20x minus 14. Negative 20 minus 14 is negative 34. And then keep the x the same. Part D, I have nested brackets. You're going to want to start with the innermost set of brackets and then work your way out. So I'm going to distribute the 4 to the x and the 3 to get rid of that innermost set of brackets. So I will leave the 2 on the outside. And then I have a 2x that'll just stay. Plus, now I'm going to find the product of 4 times x and four times three, four times X is just four X. And four times three is positive 12. So I've gotten rid of the innermost set of brackets. I notice inside those square brackets I drew, I have a two X plus four X, those are like terms. I could collect those together to be six X. 
And now I'll distribute the two to both the 6x and the 12. 2 times 6x is 12x, and 2 times 12 is 24. If you notice for the last two questions we just did, we were simplifying expressions. We just had an expression and we wanted to write it in an equivalent but simplified form. So each line I wrote started with an equal sign showing that it's equivalent to the line above. That's an important thing to make sure you're doing to clearly communicate your solution. So that's something that I look for when I'm marking a student's work. I wanna make sure they're accurately communicating what they're doing, their work is organized, and on each line it starts with an equal sign. We're now going to move on to solving equations. Let's move on to question 39, where it says solve the following equations. And it even puts a reminder, don't forget you can check your solution. So instead of having an expression that needs to be simplified, we now have two expressions that it says are equal to each other, and our goal is to figure out what value of the variable makes the two expressions equal to each other. And we'll follow some algebra rules to help us isolate the variable to figure out the answer. So for part A, 3x minus 17 equals 13. That means 3 times something minus 17 is equal to 13. We'll start by isolating the term that has the x. We'll isolate the 3x. Right now, 17 is being subtracted from 3x. I can move this term to the other side by doing the inverse operation. So the inverse, meaning opposite of subtracting 17, would be adding 17. So what I have is 3x equals 13 plus 17. And 13 plus 17 is 30. Now I have 3 times something is 30. I'm sure you know at this point the answer is going to be 10 because 3 times 10 is 30, but how do we show that algebraically? We want to isolate the x, and currently it is being multiplied by 3. So we can move that factor of 3 to the other side by doing the inverse of multiplying by 3, which is dividing by 3. So I would have x equals 30 divided by 3, and 30 divided by 3 is 10. We can check and make sure 10 is the correct answer. Doing a quick left side, right side check, the left side of the equation is 3x minus 17, and the right side is 13. If I plug my answer of 10 in for the variable x, it should make the left side and right side the same. So let's check. I'll plug in 10 for x. I get 30 minus 17 on the left side, which is 13. Notice that's the same as the right side, so we have the correct answer to the equation. One other thing I want to add, if we look at the second line of my solution, Really what's happening between the second and third line is I'm dividing both sides of this equation by 3. Whenever you do algebra, really what you're doing is you're doing the same thing to both sides of the equation. So really what's happening is I'm dividing both sides by 3 so that the factors of 3 on the left cancel, and I'm left with just x on the left and a 30 divided by a 3 on the right. Just like the first step to this question, really what happened was we added 17 to both sides of this equation. It makes those terms on the left cancel out. So all we're left is 3x on the left, and on the right, 13 plus 17. Part B has a fraction. We can always get rid of any fraction you have in an equation by multiplying both sides of the equation by the denominator of the fraction. So let's start by doing that. I'll multiply the entire left side by 4, and the entire right side by 4. We can do whatever we want as long as we do it to both sides. The reason why this is useful is because on the left, I have a 4 divided by 4, which is 1, so those cancel out. And on the left, I'm just left with 2x plus 5. And on the right, I have 4 times 2, which is 8. I'll now isolate the term that has the x, so I'll isolate 2x by moving the plus 5 to the other side, and it becomes a minus 5. So 2x equals 8 minus 5. So 2x equals 3. The x is being multiplied by 2, so to isolate it, I do the inverse of multiplying by 2, which is dividing by 2. So on the right, I have x equals 3 over 2 which is 1.5, but we can leave our answer as a fraction. So there's my final answer, x equals 3 over 2. Part C, notice I have two terms that have the variable p that I'm trying to solve for. So I'm going to need to eventually get all the terms that have a p to the same side of the equation. Before I can do that, I'll have to expand the left and right side of the equation. So on the left, I'll distribute the 3 to the 2p and the 1. So I'll have 3 times 2p, which is 6p and 3 times 1, which is positive 3, equals, and on the right, 5 times p is 5p, and 5 times 1 is positive 5. 
Now I need to get all the terms that have the variable to one side and all the constants to the other side. So I'll bring the variable terms to the left. So I have a 6p. And when I bring the positive 5p from the right side across the equal sign to the left side, it's going to change its sign. So it's going to become a negative 5p. On the right side of the equation, the 5 is staying. And I'm bringing the positive 3 from the left across the equal sign to the right. So it's going to change from a plus 3 to a minus 3. 6p minus 5p is 1p, and 5 minus 3 is 2. So there's my final answer, p equals 2. And don't forget, you could check that in the original equation to make sure it's true. If I plugged in 2 for p, on the left, I would have 2 times 2, which is 4, plus 1 is 5, times 3 is 15. So the left would be 15. And the right, if I plugged in 2 for p, 2 plus 1 is 3, times 5 is 15. So it makes the left and right both 15. Therefore, that's the correct answer. Part D, I have a fraction equals a fraction. When you have that, you can cross multiply as a shortcut, or anytime you have multiple fractions, you can get rid of them by multiplying both sides of the equation by a common multiple of your denominators. So a common multiple between eight and four is eight. So I can multiply both sides by eight. On the left side of the equation, I have eight divided by eight, which is one, so those cancel. And on the right, I have eight divided by four, which is two. So the left side of the equation is just 3x plus 2, and the right side is 2 times 3x minus 2. I have two terms of the variable. I'll need to get them on the same side, but before I can do that, I need to expand the right side by distributing the 2 to the 3x and the negative 2. So 2 times 3x is 6x, and 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. I'll get the variable terms to the right this time, and the constant terms to the left, so the 2 will stay on the left side of the equal sign. I'll bring the negative 4 from the right side of the equal sign across to the left, so it becomes a positive 4. The 6x is staying on the right. Bring the positive 3x from the left to the right side of the equation, so it becomes a negative 3x. So I have 6 equals 3x. To isolate the variable that's being multiplied by 3, I have to do the inverse of multiplying by 3, which is dividing by 3. So 6 over 3 equals x, so I know x is 2. And I know you could have solved this question by cross multiplying instead. Let me just very quickly show you that that would get you to the same answer. When you have fraction equals a fraction, you can cross multiply. I can do the product of 8 and 3x minus 2 on one side of the equation, and the product of 4 and 3x plus 2 on the other side of the equation. And then solving this equation will get us the same answer of 2 that we got doing it the other way. Probably the most efficient way to solve this equation from here would be to divide both sides by 4. That'll cancel those out, and 8 divided by 4 is 2. But I would probably see most students at this point just start distributing to expand. I mean, it'll work. It'll get you the same answer. Let me just show you. We would have on the left 24x minus 16, and on the right 12x plus 8. Bring the variable terms to the left and the constant terms to the right. I'd have 12x equals 24. 12 times what is 24? Well, if I do 24 divided by 12, it'll tell me that the answer is 2. Same answer we got by doing the question the other way. The last equation to solve, part E, I see three x's. I'm going to need to get them all to the same side of the equation. So I'll start by expanding to get rid of the brackets so that I can start moving terms around. On the left, I'll distribute the 3. So 3 times 2x is 6x, and 3 times negative 5 is negative 15. I also have this term of negative x. I'll leave there. On the right, a common mistake here would be to think you have to distribute the 4. But that's not what we have. It's not 4 multiplied by 3x minus 7. It's 4 minus 3x plus 7. So two ways to think of this. You could just think of subtracting both of those terms, or you could think of it as a negative one that is multiplying into both of those terms. Either way, you'll get the same result. So this four is just gonna stay, and then negative one times three x is negative three x, and negative one times seven is negative seven. Let's bring all the variable terms to the left. So I'll leave the six x, the negative one x, bring the negative three x over, it becomes positive three x and get all the constant terms on the right. There's already a four and a negative seven there. And I'll bring over the negative 15, making it a positive 15. 
collect all the like terms on the left, I have 8x. And on the right, I have 12. Isolate the x by doing the inverse of multiplying by 8, which is dividing by 8. And 4 goes into both 12 and 8. It goes into 12 three times, into 8 twice, so it reduces to 3 over 2. Notice when solving an equations, the proper format is to create a new line anytime you're simplifying anything. And on the new line, you need a left side of the equation, a right side of the equation, and an equal sign between those two sides. Let's now do the word problems. Number 40, show a full algebraic solution to either part A or part E, not both. Make sure to clearly communicate your final answer. I'll answer both for you, just in case you're curious as to what they would be. Um, part A says the length of a rectangle is three centimeters more than double the width. The perimeter of the rectangle is 96 centimeters. What are the dimensions, the length and width of the rectangle? For this question, we need to solve for length and width. So what I'm going to have to do is be able to write an expression for the length and width in terms of the same variable, then create an equation that involves that variable and be able to solve that equation. So notice the question says the length of the rectangle is three more than double the width. But I don't know what the width is, so I'm going to assign the width to be x. And now I need to write an expression for length in terms of that same variable. The length is equal to 3 more than double the width. So it's equal to 3 more than double x. So the length would be double x plus 3, so 2x plus 3. And I know the perimeter of the rectangle is 96, so with that information I can create my equation. Remember the perimeter of a rectangle would be 2 times the length plus 2 times the width. And in this case, our length is 2x plus 3, and our width is x. And we know the perimeter, so I'll make the left side of this equation 96. I now need to solve this equation for x. I'll start by distributing the 2 on the right side of the equation to the 2x and the 3. 2 times 2x is 4x, 2 times 3 is 6, and I have plus 2x. I'll bring the constant terms to the left, so I'll bring the plus 6 over, becomes a minus 6. On the right, I've got 4x plus 2x. This simplifies to 90 equals 6x. And to isolate the x, I'll have to do the opposite of multiplying by 6, which is dividing by 6. So I'll have x equals 90 divided by 6 which is 15. So x is 15, which means my width is 15 centimeters, and my length is 2 times 15 plus 3, which is 33 centimeters. We should write a final answer as a sentence. We should say the rectangle has a length of 33 centimeters and a width of 15 centimeters. Let me now erase this and let's try part B instead. Part B says in a triangle, the measure of the middle angle is double the measure of the smallest angle and 15 degrees less than the measure of the biggest angle. Find the measure of the angles. Use a diagram to help. So the three things I'm trying to solve for in part B are the small angle, the middle angle, and the big angle. So I have to come up with an expression using the same variable for all three of these. So let's see what the first sentence says. It says the measure of the middle angle is double the measure of the smallest angle. But I don't know what the smallest angle is. So let me start by calling the smallest angle x. And I know the middle angle is double that, so it would be 2x. And then let me keep reading. And it also says, that, so not only is the middle angle double the measure of the smallest, but it's also 15 degrees less than the measure of the biggest angle. Another way of saying that would be the biggest angle is 15 degrees more than the middle angle. So the biggest angle would be 2x plus 15. Now I can create an equation because I know the angles in a triangle have to add to 180. So I know that x plus 2x plus 2x plus 15 has to be equal to 180. I'll keep all the variable terms on the left. I'll bring the plus 15 to the other side, becomes minus 15. So I have on the left 1x plus 2x plus 2x, that's 5x. And on the right, 180 minus 15 is 165. Divide both sides by 5, and 165 divided by 5 is 33. So my smallest angle is 33. My middle angle is double that, 
which is 66. And my biggest angle is even 15 more than the middle angle. So it's 81. Do a quick check, make sure they add to 180. I would have 33 plus 66, which is 99, plus 81, which is 180. And we should write a sentence saying the angles of the triangle are 33 degrees, 66 degrees, and 81 degrees. And there's the final answer. Let's move on to our next section, linear relations. Question 41 is about data collection and different sampling methods. So you'll have to understand the definition of simple, systematic, stratified, and non-random sampling. So we'll look at each of the four scenarios and see which one matches which. Scenario one says you give a survey to the tallest students in your class. In that scenario, there's no random method used at all. You're picking the people yourself and you're choosing them because they're the tallest. That's a perfect example of non-random sampling. So scenario one is D. Scenario two, giving a survey to the 10 students whose names were drawn from a hat. So when everyone in a population gets an equal chance of being picked on each draw, that is called a simple random sample. So scenario two, simple random sampling. Scenario three, giving a survey to 10% of girls and 10% of boys in the class. So in this scenario, the population was divided into two groups and then within each group, a simple random sample of an equal proportion were done. That is stratified random sampling. The key thing I noticed there is that the population was put into groups and then within each group, a simple random sample was done. So that's stratified. Scenario four, giving a survey to every fourth person alphabetically. In that case, when you sample at an interval, that's systematic random sampling. So scenario B. <clears throat> Question 42 says, based on the following table of values, is this a direct or partial variation? I see when X is zero, Y is three. So I know this is a partial variation. For it to be a direct variation, the initial value would have to be zero, meaning when x is zero, y would be zero. But in this case, the initial value is three. When x is zero, y is three, so we see that's a partial variation. Part B says to fill in the missing information in the table. So if I look at the x values, it goes zero, one, two, three, four. The y values go three, seven, 11, 15. And then I'm not seeing the value of y that goes with the x value of four. If we look at the pattern, the x values are going up by one and the y values are going up by four. So the next y value must be 19. But then notice it skips from 19 to 31. So it went up by four, how many times? 19 to 23 would be going up by four once, to 27 twice, to 31 three times. So it went up by four three times. So I must add three to that x value, which is seven. So it skipped over the point 523, 627, and it went to the point 731. Part C says, what is the constant of variation, which we call the slope or the rate of change. We use the letter M. To calculate M, we need to calculate what's the change in Y divided by the change in X. And we can do that in an organized way by doing Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. So we have to pick a point to be our first point and a point to be our second point. We might as well just use the first two points. I'll make the first row my first point, so that's my x1, y1. And the second row is my second point, so that's my second x-coordinate and my second y-coordinate. If I follow the formula, it tells me to find the change in y, so I would do seven minus three, divided by the change in x. x2 minus x1 is one minus zero. So I get four over one, which is four. My m value is four. What's the initial value? That means when x is zero, what's y? When x is zero, y is three. And we have a variable we use for that initial value, we call it b, so I can say b equals three. Write an equation in the form y equals mx plus b. Just take your answer for m and b and plug them into the equation. So I would have y equals four x plus three. This equation defines the relationship between the x and y value of any point on the line in terms of its slope and y-intercept. So we could actually check and make sure these answers from part B are correct, assuming we have the correct equation showing the relationship between x and y. If I wanna check and make sure 19 is correct when x is four, well, let's check, what do I get for y if I plug four in for x? 
I get 16 plus 3, which is 19. So that's good. But what do I get for x if I plugged in 31 for y? 31 plus 4x plus 3. Let's subtract the 3 over. I would get 28 equals 4x. Divide the 4, I get 7. So that's correct as well. Let's move on to the next question, which asks us to calculate slopes of lines. So remember slope, we use the variable m to represent that, and we calculate it by doing change in y over change in x, which graphically speaking is rise over run. Or algebraically, if we wanted to calculate it, we could find the coordinates of the points and do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. It's up to you. Just whatever you're doing, make sure you pay attention to the scale of your graph and make sure you know what your scale is going up by. In this case, our scale is going by ones. So when I move down or up or left or right a unit on my grid, it is by one. So it should be easy to calculate this one. I'll show you for the first line segment um, from A to B, how we could calculate the slope both ways, just by counting rise and run and by doing it algebraically using our change in Y over change in X. So if I were to just count rise and run, I have to pick what point I wanna start at I can either start at A or B, doesn't matter, and then go to the next one. So to get from A to B, I would have to go down one, two, three, four, five, six units. So that would mean that my rise is negative six. When going down, that's a negative rise. And then I would have to go to the right, two units. Going to the right is a positive run. So that would be what, give me a run of two. And negative six divided by two it simplifies to negative three. So my slope is negative three. We could have gotten that same answer by writing the coordinates of both of the points and then assigning one of them to be the first point. I'll just make A my first point. So that's my first X, first Y. Point B, I'll make my second point. So that's my second X and my second Y. And then if I follow the formula, Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1, I would get zero minus six divided by six minus four. That gives me negative six over two, which once again is negative three. The same answer, just approaching it in a different way. C, D, let's just do it using rise over run. So to get from C to D, I would have to go up one, two, three, four units. And when you're going up, that's a positive rise. So my rise is positive four. And my run, from there, I would have to go to the right, one, two, three, four, five, six. So my run is six, and we're going to the right, it's positive. Four over six simplifies to two over three. One thing I want you to notice is that a line segment that's going down to the right is gonna have a negative slope, and a line segment that's going up to the right is going to have a positive slope. So make sure the sign of your final answers always makes sense based on what you're seeing in the graph. 44, use the graph of this line to answer the following questions. What's the y-intercept of line? So I would look and see where does it cross the y-axis. And I actually don't see a scale here, so I'll assume it's going by ones, but here's the y-intercept. It's at the point zero, negative two. So the y-intercept, we use b as the variable for the y-intercept. I'll say b is negative two. The slope of the line, I'll just have to count the rise and the run to get between any pair of points on this line. I'll do the two points it has labeled for me. To get between those two points, I would have to go up three and right two. Up is a positive rise, so positive three, and right is a positive run, so positive two. So the equation of this line in the form y equals mx plus b is y equals three over two x minus two. Question 45 wants us to graph the following lines. Notice for part a, the line is already in the format y equals mx plus b. The b value is negative four, and we always start by plotting the y-intercept, which is the b value, negative four. So I'll start by plotting the point on the y-axis at negative four. That's always the first thing you do for these questions. And then from that point, you use the slope, which is the m value, which is the coefficient of the x, one over two in this case, to plot more points. The numerator of your slope is your rise and the denominator is your run. So from that y-intercept, I have to rise one, which means up one, and run two, which means right two. And then just keep rising one and running two to plot more points. Fill the grid with as many points as you can. 
That's all of the points I can plot to the right of the y-intercept. I can plot points to the left of the y-intercept by instead of going up one and right two, do the opposite, go down one and left two. And notice that will give you more points that fall on the same line. Why does that work? Well, because one over two is equivalent to negative one over negative two. They both have a value of 0.5, they're equivalent to each other. So you can either go up one right two or down one left two, and it gives you points on the same line. And when drawing your line through the points, make sure you put arrows on both sides, showing that it is a continuous line that continues forever. Let's do part B. It's also already in the format y equals mx plus b. My b value is the constant at the end, it's two, so my y-intercept is going to be at two. And my slope, my m value, is the coefficient of the x. Now this time it's negative three, but it'll help for me to think of that as a fraction, negative three over one, so that I can see what the rise and the run are. Any whole number you can write over one. So my rise is negative three. That means from my y-intercept that I plotted, I'm gonna go down three, one, two, three, and then run one, which means write one. And then fill my grid with points, keep going down three, write one. And then to get points to the left of the y-intercept, do the opposite of down three, write one, which would be up three, left one connect them with a line, and make sure you have arrows on both ends of your line. My next two equations are special examples of lines. Part C is a horizontal line. It's the horizontal line y equals four. So that means the y value of my line is always four. The only way the y value of the line can be always four is if it is a horizontal line that crosses through four on the y-axis. Notice that this line, the y value of any point on this line would be four. That's why we define the equation of this line as y equals four. Part D, the equation is x equals negative three. So the x value is always negative three. The only type of line which would have a constant x value that is not changing would be a vertical line. So it'll be the vertical line that passes through negative three on the x axis. So x equals a number is a vertical line, and y equals a number is a horizontal line. And the number will actually tell you where you'll cross the x or the y axis. 46, this is the first time where it doesn't give us a graph, it just gives us two points on the line and asks us to find the equation of the line. Our end goal for this is to write the equation in the format y equals mx plus b, so we'll have to solve for m and b. Let's start by solving for the slope of our line, m. And we can use our formula y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Pick either a or b to be your first point. It doesn't matter. I'll pick a to be the first point. Each point has an x and a y, so I'll call those coordinates x1, y1. And point b, I'll call those coordinates x2, y2. If I follow the formula for slope, I would have 2 minus 8 divided by negative 2 minus negative 5. This would give me negative six over negative two minus negative five is negative two plus five, which is three. So my slope is negative six over three, which is negative two. So my slope is negative two. To solve for b into y equals mx plus b, I need to sub in the slope I just solved for, which is negative two. And any point x, y that is on my line, I know two points that are on the line. You could pick either point A or point B to be your x and y values. I'll pick point B. The y value is two. The x value is negative two. And then we will solve for the only unknown, B. So on the right, I have a product of negative two and negative two, that's four. To isolate B, I'll subtract the four to the other side. So I get B is negative two. So my final equation will always leave y and x, but sub in m and b. And in this case, m and b are both negative two. So it'll be negative two x plus negative two, which I'll write as minus two. 47 is a very similar question, but this time it gives us the slope. It tells us the m value is two, and it tells us what point it goes through. So into y equals mx plus b, I can sub in my point for x and y, my slope for m and solve for b, and then I can write the equation. y is negative three, m is two, x is four. Solving this for b, I would move the eight to the other side, making it minus eight, and I get b is negative 11. 
So my final answer will be y equals 2x minus 11. Question 48, find the equation of the line that is parallel to the line 4x plus 5y plus 2 equals 0 and goes through the point 5, negative 3. This is very similar to the previous question. It gives us the slope and a point. It's just it gives us the slope in a little bit of a tricky way. It tells us it's parallel to this line, which means it has the same slope as that line. But I'll need to rearrange the equation of that line it gives us into the format y equals mx plus b to be able to see what the slope is. So I need to isolate the y. I'll move the 4x over, making it a negative 4x. Move the positive 2 over, making it a minus 2. I need to isolate the y. It's currently being multiplied by 5. So to the other side, I need to divide by 5. I need to divide all the terms by 5. So it'd be negative 4 over 5x minus 2 over 5. So I can now see that the slope of this line is negative 4 over 5. So the slope is negative 4 over 5. So I know the m value. The only thing I don't know is b, the y-intercept. So I can plug in the slope that I know, negative 4 over 5, and the point, 5, negative 3, as my x, y, and then solve for b. So y is negative 3. m is negative 4 over 5. x is 5. And then I don't know b. This will simplify nicely because I have no 5 divided by 5. That's 1. Those cancel out. So I have negative 3 equals negative 4 plus b. Move the negative 4 over, becomes positive 4. And I get b equals 1. So my final equation is y equals negative 4 over 5x plus 1. Question 49 says find the x and y intercepts of this line 4x plus 5y equals 20. I'll start by finding the x-intercept. I know that wherever the function crosses the x-axis, the y-coordinate is going to be 0. So all I have to do is set the y value to 0 by subbing in 0 for y and solving the equation. So I have 4x plus 5 times 0, that's 4x plus 0, equals 20. Divide the 4 to the other side, and I get x is 5. So my x-intercept is going to be at the point 5, 0. To find the y-intercept, I know wherever the line crosses the y-axis, the x-coordinate is going to be 0. So sub in 0 for x, and solve this equation for y. 4 times 0 is 0, that's gone. I have 5y equals 20. Divide the 5 to the other side, and I have y equals 4. So the y-intercept is at the point 0, 4. To find the x-intercept, set y to 0 and solve. Find the y-intercept, set x to 0 and solve. Here is our last linear relationship question. Data has been collected from a basketball player. The following table shows the number of successful jump shots Michael Jensorden made at various distances from the basket. Identify the independent and dependent variables. In a table of values, you're always going to find your independent variable on the left. That's our x. And the dependent variable, which we usually call y, will be on the right column of your table. So our independent variable is the distance from the basket. That's the one that we control. And the dependent variable is shots made. And that's the one that should be affected by your independent variable, the distance. So the number of shots you make should depend on the distance you are from the basket. Part B asks us to graph the relationship. Make sure you put your independent variable on the x-axis. So the x-axis will be my distance from the basket. And my y-axis is going to be the shots made. And now I need to pick a scale to go up by. For my independent variable, for distance, I need to go as high as 11. So if I look at how many spots I have here, I think I have 22 units along the x-axis. I could go up by 0.5s and make 11 fit. So I'll label every other spot going up by ones. And on the y-axis, I need to go as high as at least 22. It looks like I will have to go up by ones to make this fit. So I'll label every other spot going up by twos. And now I'll have to plot each point that I get from the data that was collected. From 3 meters, 22 shots were made. So I'll go to 3 on the x-axis and then go up to 22 on the y-axis and plot a point. From 4 meters from the basket, I don't know how many shots were made. There's probably going to be a question about that later. From 5 meters from the basket, 17 were made. So 
my x value is 5, my y value is 17. So I'll plot a point at 5, 17. From 6 meters from the basket, 14 shots were made. So I'll go to the point 6, 14. 7 meters, 15 baskets were made. Eight meters, 10 baskets were made. Nine meters, four baskets were made. 10 meters, three baskets were made. And 11 meters, only one basket was made. Part C asked me to draw a line or curve of best fit. So it looks like a fairly linear relationship. So I'll draw a line of best fit. When drawing a line of best fit, you're going to want to make sure you go through as many points as possible, keeping roughly an equal number of points above and below the line and make sure your line shows the trend in the data fairly well. So I think my line of best fit will look like this. Notice I've got a few points below the line, a few points above the line. It shows the trend in the data. I think that's a fairly accurate line of best fit. And part D says, is the relationship linear or nonlinear? Well, I decided that it was linear because a line seemed to represent the data well. And it says, predict the number of shots he would make if you were four meters from the basket. Four meters from the basket to make a prediction, I'll have to figure out where is my line of best fit at four meters. It looks like it's right about there pretty close to a Y value of 21. So my trend line predicts that there would be 21 baskets made. The second part of this question says, was that interpolation or extrapolation? This was interpolation because I estimated for a distance of four meters and that's within the range of the data I have. I have data that goes from three meters to 11 meters. So any estimation between three and 11 would be interpolation but any estimation for a value beyond three and 11, so either less than three or bigger than 11, that would be extrapolation. So this one was interpolation. Last section of the exam is geometry. Question 51 says find the volume of either of those shapes. Volume is always area of base times height for any type of prism. For a rectangular prism, the volume is just length times width times height. Based on your perspective, you could assign any of those three as your length, width, or height. I'll say my length is nine, my width is eight, and my height is six. So that equals 432 centimeters cubed. When doing volume, you'll always get units cubed. Now we don't have to do part B because it says do A or B, not both. But I'll just show you what the answer would be. The volume of a triangular base prism, the formula is half BLH, where B is the base of the triangle, L is the height of the triangle, and H is the height of the prism. So if I plug into this formula, it would be half times four times three times 10. That would give me 60 centimeters cubed. 52 says find the surface area of either A or B, not both. I'll show you both. For a sphere, the surface area formula is four pi r squared. In this case, in the diagram, it looks like it's labeling the diameter to be eight, which means that the radius is half of that, which is four. Let me get an approximate answer by my calculator doing the product of four pi and four squared. I get about 201.1 .1 if I round to one decimal place. For a cone, the surface area is pi r s plus pi r squared. Pi r s gives us the lateral surface and pi r squared gives us the area of the base of the cone. Now for this one, I have the radius. The radius looks like it is 10. And I have the height of the cone, but I don't have S, which is the slant of the cone. 
So to solve for s, notice the right triangle inside the cone, I can use Pythagorean theorem. So let me off to the side, just show my work. s squared would equal 10 squared plus 24 squared. So s squared equals 676. s would be the square root of that, which is 26. So I now know the slant height is 26 centimeters. So into my formula, I can input the radius of 10 and the slant height of 26. And I'll type this on my calculator to get an approximate value. And I get about 1131 centimeters squared. Notice surface area is units squared. Volume is units cubed. 53, once again, asks us to do either A or B, not both. Part A, there's a few ways we could do this. The most efficient way would be to know that two interior angles of a triangle are going to be equal to the opposite exterior angle of the triangle. So I know that X plus 68 is going to be equal to 130. Subtract the 68 to the other side, and I figure out x equals 62. So x is 62, and I should say degrees. If I want to solve for y, notice that 68 and y form a straight line. So those angles are supplementary, which means they add to 180 degrees. Therefore, 68 plus y equals 180. Isolate y by subtracting the 68. And I get y equals 112 degrees. And the last angle I don't know is angle z. It forms a straight line with x. So I know that z and x add to 180. And remember, we know the answer for x. x is 62. Subtract the 62 to the other side. And I get 118 degrees. Let me move on to part B. If I focus on the top triangle, I have two of the three angles. I know that the three angles in a triangle add to 180. So 65 plus 50 plus y equals 180. 65 plus 50 is 115. y would be equal 180 minus 115. So y is equal to 65 degrees. Angle y and z are opposite angles. And I know that opposite angles are equal to each other. So z is also equal to 65 degrees. And then lastly, I can solve for x. If I look at the bottom triangle, I know all three angles have to add to 180. So 74 plus 65 plus x has to equal 180. 139 plus x equals 180. x equals 180 minus 139. x equals... 41. 54, once again, says do A or B. I'll show you the answers for both. In part A, I have the two angles inside of a C pattern. That's called the co-interior angle theorem. I know that angles inside a C pattern have to add up to 180. So 11x plus 10 plus 10x minus 40 equals 180. 11x plus 10x is 21x. 10 minus 40 is negative 30. Let me move that negative 30 to the other side. 180 plus 30 is 210. Divide the 21, 210 divided by 21 is 10. So x equals 10. Part B, we also have to solve for x. And I know that two interior angles of a triangle are equal to the opposite exterior angle. So I can set up my equation. On the left, if I collect like terms, I have 4x plus 22 equals 5x. I'll bring the variable terms to the right. So I have 5x minus 4x on the right. So 22 equals x. We're almost done. Last question. Solve for the missing side of each triangle. They're both right triangles, so I know Pythagorean theorem holds true for these. Pythagorean theorem tells me that the sum of the squares of the shorter two sides equals the square of the longer side. 
And you may have seen that written as a squared plus b squared equals c squared. C is your hypotenuse, which is always across from the right angle, and it's always the longest side of your right triangle. So here's C. The legs, the shorter two sides, doesn't matter which one you call A and which one you call B. If I plug into my formula, 36 squared plus B squared equals 39 squared. I need to rearrange to isolate B, so I'll have B squared equals 39 squared minus 36 squared. 39 squared minus 36 squared is 225. To isolate B, it's currently being squared. The inverse of squaring is square rooting, so I must square root 225 to solve for B. And the square root of 225 is 15. Part B, I know the shorter two sides. I know the legs, A and B. I don't know the side across from the right angle, the hypotenuse, which we'll call C. If I plug into Pythagorean theorem, it would be 32 squared plus 26 squared equals C squared. 32 squared plus 26 squared is 1,700. To isolate C, it's currently being squared, so I have to do the inverse of squaring, which is square rooting. And the square root of 1,700 is about 41.2. In this case, we know units, so I'll write centimeters. All right, that's it for the exam. Hopefully this in some way has helped you either prepare for your exam, review stuff from when you took grade nine, or helped you look ahead and preview what's in a grade nine course.